This video is brought to you by Wicket Cricket Manager. Do you want to know how far Australia sunk after Shane Warne's retirement? Well, they turned to offspin. Of course, by that point, they had tried Hogg, Begill, Cass and McGain, and even Cullen Bailey had a contract. So perhaps everyone who'd bowled with spin had already gotten a go. But you need to know just how little Australians think of offspin. Gideon Haig once called it cricket's rubbish skill. Usually for the Aussies, offspinners would only be used when touring Asia. Like the time they took Gavin Robertson, a 10-year vet who was playing Sydney grade cricket, to go and bowl against Sachin Tendulkar. Why would, why would you do that to someone? But years later, they had learned absolutely nothing. And they would do essentially a similar thing with Jason Crazier. When Australia took him to India, he had 55 wickets in first class cricket at an average of 49. He had never taken more than four wickets in an innings, and that is probably why they tried Cameron White over him when they arrived. But by the last test, Australia were one nil down and they had little choice but to throw him the ball. Their desperation led to one of the greatest and weirdest and stupidest debuts in the history of our game. He bowled like runs did not exist. It was a purely attacking spell. Sewag, Dravid, Tadulka, Laxman, Ganguly and Dhoni, it didn't matter who was in front of him. The ball was going to be flighted and ripped. And he did it again and he just kept going and going and going. It was the way that spinners bowl in the nets. Only he was bowling to legends of batting who were hitting him for fours and sixes that he ignored. Oh, but there are also wickets. Oh, so many wickets. Wickets everywhere. Eight of them in the first innings alone for only 215 runs. Off 43.5 overs. It was basically flight four, flight six, flight wicket. And in the next innings, he just kept going. 4 for 143 of 31 overs. You can design all the AI you want. None of it is ever going to explain to you what the hell was going on with Jason Crazier in that test match. It is the most expensive 12 wicket spell in the history of cricket. And not by a little. It is 0.7 runs and over more than any other bowler with that amount of wickets. I mean, what do you even do with this information at a certain point? And his next test was just as weird. And Australia was in the exact same situation. Yes, he got smashed everywhere, but he took 12 wickets. How can you not play him again? How can you play him again? And yet his next test was just as weird. He took one wicket in the first innings. Hashim Amla. Then Australia set South Africa 414 at the Wacker. And of course you would expect your spinner to help you in that situation. Even if he might struggle a little bit in the non-friendly Western Australian surface. But Crazier did not take a single wicket. He went at more than four runs and over in that innings, and South Africa chased down the second biggest total in the history of our game, losing only four wickets along the journey. And that was it. Jason Crazier never played another test match again. He took the world's weirdest 12 wicket haul and then gave up the second biggest chase and then walked off into the sunset. In two tests, he had more weirdness than most 15 year vets ever have. So now Australia had tried the most extravagant offing. They went for the most milk toast one they had. Nathan Horrocks. In 2004, he made his debut when, you're not going to believe this, Australia made another spinner have their debut on Indian soil against the best players in the world. He took five wickets in that match and yet just disappeared back into shield cricket afterwards. But with Crazier getting injured, McGain still out, and Casson already showing signs he was struggling, Horrocks went from being 12th man for New South Wales to Australia's frontline spinner. And at the start, he actually did okay. After 13 tests, he was averaging slightly better than 30. And that should have won everyone over. Yet absolutely no one seemed to believe in him. He was clearly never going to be a long-term solution. But it was weird how little the Australians seemed to back him, even when he was doing well. But it wasn't just the Australians, of course. Chris Gale compared Horace's bowling to his own. And then the Universe boss went out there and smashed 100 from 72 balls, including 32 runs from 19 of Horace's deliveries. He only hit four boundaries off him though, but they were all sixes. Essentially, Horrocks never really spun the ball and that was a big part of the issue, but he also seemed to lack just confidence. Despite everyone thinking the deciding 09 Ashes pitch at the Oval would spin, Australia did not pick Horrocks. Not because of form as much, but almost completely because he didn't show enough confidence or bravado when they asked him if he wanted to play in that game. I think overall, Horrocks' figures probably flatter him a little bit. There was a reason why he was not first choice for New South Wales when he was originally chosen, and he was another spinner who had to move away from his home wicket, the Gabba, because it didn't spin. In fact, as drop-ins started to become more common, the SCG was kind of the only place that you could really bowl spin at that point, meaning that no Australian spinners had any confidence. 
Of course, that didn't matter to Shane Warne because he had more confidence than all of them combined. But the selectors made it very clear that they never believed in Horace. They even told him to go off and work on his batting at one stage to ensure that he stayed in the team. He would make his maiden first class 100 in the Sheffield Shield after that, and he also pulled out this win in the Champions Trophy, in a tournament that he helped Australia win. They dropped him anyway. He just wasn't who they wanted. They made that very clear. And when a story broke in his local newspaper during the 10-11 Ashes that he was selling his Australian kit, despite being only 29 at the time and still had very realistic chance of playing for his country again, everyone believed it. It turned out to not quite be a real story anyway. But the truth is, the people bought it because of what had happened to him at that point and his lack of confidence. If anyone was going to sell his own kit during his career, it was going to be Nathan Horace, the guy who had completely overperformed and now delivered on what he was sold as, and yet still was discarded when Australia had no one better than him. He would end up with the third most wickets since Shane Warne as a spinner. And no one cared. And while the story about his kit was actually in the news, on the other side of the country, the Australian spin was actually getting weirder. But to tell this story properly, you need to know some things. Kevin Peterson was in the middle of a crisis against left arm finger spin because basically DRS had come in and how you had to play it had changed. And he somehow got himself in a war of words with Yuvraj Singh, which actually made the issue far bigger than it needed to be. For instance, at one stage, Mohammed Issam, the Crick Info writer, once got dragged into the nets to bowl to KP. Such was his problems with how to play a form of bowling that he once used to smash the hell out of. But the other weird thing going on at that stage was during the 10-11 Ashes, there was going to be a reality TV show type selection policy for the Australian team ahead of the first test. They planned to have a huge event in Sydney, except for the fact it rained and no one cared. But they had this ginormous squad because clearly they didn't know what to do. But out of all of that, they picked Xavier Doherty, a white ball specialist who happened to be a left arm finger spinner. And at this stage, he'd never taken more than 25 wickets in a season. He just was not a first class bowler. And that's basically how the first two tests played out. And so when Doherty only took three wickets in those two games, Australia moved on from him, but they didn't throw away their left arm finger spin gambit. They doubled down. And when they turned up to the whacker, Michael Beer was picked because of his knowledge of Western Australian wickets. The only problem being that he had only just moved there from Western Australia and had played less on the whacker than say, let's just pick a random player here, Nathan Horace. And Beer really struggled for Australia. He should have taken the wicket of Alistair Cook, except for the fact he overstepped. He would later open up the bowling for Australia in a West Indies test, but eventually he would boss the big bash, which is probably what he was best at anyway. And the reason that Beer and Doherty were chosen was because in a tour game, KP had been bowled by a left arm finger spinner. Except it wasn't one of those two guys. It was Steve O'Keefe, who had started Australia's plan, but not been used to execute it. Being that he could also hold a bat, he made 66 in that same match, it was baffling that he never got a go. By this point, Steve O'Keefe was five years into his first class career, yet he had only played 13 matches. He'd taken 36 wickets at 19 in 2010 though. So um, why was he overlooked for two guys who were clearly not suited to the job? And that happening to O'Keefe perhaps had something to do with the fact it was a little bit too early in his career. But realistically, Australia waited another four years to actually pick the only spinner taking wickets in domestic Australian cricket. And think about the stories that we've heard so far. I mean, it is crazy that O'Keefe didn't get more of an opportunity. Australia finally had a shield spinner taking wickets and they ignored him. O'Keefe only got picked when he was the highest wicket taker in Australian cricket one year, and that was with an average of 20. Since Colin Miller, Australia had seen nothing like this. A spinner actually taking domestic wickets. And to be honest, O'Keefe would have taken a lot more in first class cricket had he ever stayed fit. But when he did play for Australia in India, like Krasia, he also took a 12 wicket haul on Indian soil. But unlike the Offie, O'Keefe beasted India and helped win the test for Australia. At this stage in his career, he had 225 wickets in first class cricket at an average of 23.8. And this was his fifth test, and he'd only get four more. Throughout his career, O'Keefe was a baffling non-selection for a team that often couldn't find a spinner and certainly couldn't find a second one. He was once told by a selector that he would need to grow a foot and bowl a doucher to get picked by Australia. And usually the talk was he didn't spin it enough, which might've been true, except for the fact that no one else was spinning it any more than him. And if they were, they weren't taking any wickets with it. And he was often told that he was a white ball bowler, despite finishing his first class career with 301 wickets, 
and doing a lot better with the red ball than he ever did in one day cricket. For Australia, he would average a smidge under 30. However, he did also play a role in his own downfall. Towards the end of his career, he had a couple of really bad drunken incidents. The second one's when he said some sexually offensive things to an Australian women's team player. However, that was at the end of his career when he'd taken a lot of wickets in Shield cricket and also made some runs along the way as well. There was actually another finger spinner with fairly similar figures to O'Keefe, although nowhere near as potent. That was Victoria's John Holland. He took 298 wickets at 32.5 in his career. He struggled a lot more when he played Tess, but he only played four times overall. He has actually just recently been let go by Victoria, with his brother already having represented the US. There is a chance that he might actually go on to play for them as well. But I only mentioned Holland because in six years, Australia gave debuts to five different left arm finger spinners. They were desperate to make one of them work so they could just move away from off spin. Of course, there was one left arm finger spinner that we simply cannot ignore. Ashton Agar was a 19 year old debutante spinner who made the front page of the Times because he set the world record making 98 batting at number 11 in his debut. He also took Alistair Cook as his first wicket, being the first Aussie teenager to take a wicket with spin. And yet, almost all of that went to hell. The natural athleticism and charm seemed to peak at test one. And a decade on, he's little more than an infrequent white ball player now. Recently, he was sent home from the Indian tour because he was so bad in the nets that they thought he was unplayable. He has nine wickets in five tests and will probably never play again. And because so many spinners like Agar would come in and then disappear almost immediately. At a certain point, Australia just stopped with spin. Cameron White was a good young leg spinner and most importantly, he was blonde, broad-shouldered and Victorian. And it seemed that those things mattered quite a lot. But White didn't really spin the ball, which of course doesn't mean everything. He was very strong and quick and he possessed a very good cricket brain. In 2002 and 3, he took 28 wickets at 25. That's not too bad. But that was also the last year he looked anything like a frontline spinner or even a part-time spinner. After that, he just sort of slipped out of bowling altogether. And when he became captain of Victoria, he used himself even less. He just did not see himself as a bowler. So that made it a pretty big shock when Australia decided that he was. And, uh, you know, not everyone agreed with this selection. But due to the McGain injury, White became the number one spinner in India with Michael Clark and Simon Cadditch as his backup. I mean, Michael Clark did actually win Australia two test matches as a spinner, but even so. It's incredible to think now that Australia basically didn't have a spinner for the majority of an Indian series. White took five wickets in four matches and never played test cricket for Australia again. And how much did Australia learn from this? Well, less than a year later, Marcus North was picked for Australia as their main spinner. Years later, we would do some radio work together and I told him that he was the leading spinner in Sheffield Shield cricket when he was chosen. He looked very shocked, which is how he should have been when he was picked as essentially a batter, but mostly the frontline spinner for Australia. After 16 tests, he only had six wickets, but because he'd made runs, Australia felt obliged to keep him in the side. And North was a cluster batter. When he was in form, he looked like he could make runs against anyone. But although his off spin was very aesthetically pleasing for a part-timer, he was kind of completely toothless. Well, until his 17th match, where you could see he takes six wickets. And those were all in one innings against Pakistan at Lords. He doubled his career total in one match with some of the most bizarre batting you will ever see. Sadly, by the end of his career, North was already slumping with the bat. So despite the fact that they finally got some wickets off him, the selectors just moved on. But in that same test at Lords, Australia picked another batter who could bowl. In fact, he batted at number eight. And this may have been the best selection mistake in the history of cricket because Norse's bowling partner was Steve Smith. And you may hear people say now that Smith was picked as a leggy when he started. And yes, that is kind of true. But most people when they hear that, think of Smith as a leggy who suddenly came good at batting. No, 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 no. Steve Smith was a top order prodigy from a very young age, but he could bowl a little bit of leg spin as well. And this is the game that got Smith two tests as a leggy. Against South Australia, who were following on, Smith took seven for 64 in what was his last match before the Australians were heading to England to play Pakistan in that series. And I am not saying that this wasn't a good spell, but at this stage, he had 26 career wickets with an average of 48. But he did take three wickets at Lords. 
but it was in Australia's second innings at Headingley when they were massively behind in the game, where he smashed an all-star Pakistan attack around, making 77 batting from down the order. Afterwards, Ponting was asked if he saw Smith as someone who could bat in the top six. He said no. We all thought he couldn't, and almost everyone thought that was right. But Smith isn't even the only one, is he? Manus Labashain was brought in for his debut in Test Cricket, despite poor first-class numbers, in part because he could bowl leg spin as well. So that means that Australia found two of their greatest modern players, at least in part, because their spin bowling was so awful. But of course, through all of this, Australia did actually find a real spinner. The shadow did not stop Nathan Lyon from existing or thriving. In fact, Warren had no real impact on him at all. And Lyon kind of looked like a throwback from the start, like some forgotten old Australian spinner from the 70s. But the first ball of his career, he took Kumar Sangakkara. There was clearly something there. But despite that five wicket haul in his first test, Australia still weren't all that sure. After all, Nathan Lyon was an offie. In 2013, Lyon had a lot more experience and he went to India and in the final test there, he took seven for 95. That brought his average down to 33. But it wasn't just his numbers. It was clear from almost the first ball, well, exactly the first ball, that this was the best spinning prospect in Australia. He had no deuce or no great slider, and he put more overspin on the ball than he did side spin. but it was clear that he was doing something right. But Australia's next test after that seven-wicket haul was at Trent Bridge for the Ashes, and uh, that was Ashton Agar's test. Australia was so shell-shocked by everything that had come before that in front of them was an all-purpose off-spinner, and they traded that in for some magic beans that looked more athletic. Lyon's story as a curator turned international off-spinner is well covered, and he deserves an entire project just on him especially as he might soon take 500 test wickets. That any spinner after Warren had this level of success is incredible. But to be an off-spinner from a country that does not in any way rate that art form is absolutely amazing. The GOAT nickname is obviously part tongue-in-cheek, but it's also an honor of him surviving in the toughest place for his kind. But I lied before when I said that Shane Warren had no impact on Lyon's career, because there was a time when Warren hinted at a comeback, at least in part, because he didn't rate Lyon all that highly. Michael Clark was captain, and he played along with the Warren stuff a little bit, but Mitchell Stark was not having a bar of it. And he made it clear that Australia had a spin, and that they didn't want Warren to make a comeback. For his trouble, Stark spent the rest of his career being picked on by Shane Warren in the media. Stark's body language was a common one, as was the fact that he was soft, and occasionally he came for both Stark and Lyon as a two for one. Warren was a legend at taking wickets and holding grudges. Yet, that didn't really hold Stark or Lyon back. But weirdly, there was a Victorian leg spinner who had a massive impact on Nathan Lyon, and it was not Shane Warne. When Lyon was transforming into a South Australian off spinner, he was doing so under Darren Berry, Warne's former keeper and best friend at Victoria. But he decided he wanted to bring in a different old teammate to help Nathan Lyon. The man he contacted was Craig Howard. If you go back to the start of this series, you'll remember that is where we began. The first spinner who got in Shane Warne's shadow, so much so that he only played 16 first class matches and played his last one when he was only 21 years old. And now, Craig Howard was back as a coach, and he would team up with Lyon to give the Australian their greatest off spinner in terms of wickets and definitely in terms of impact. But Howard didn't just work with Lyon though. He also spotted another off spinner, Todd Murphy. And now he mentors both of them. Craig Howard was discarded because of Warne who went through the academy twice, once as a leggy and then as an offie, whose original career ended with his captain telling him to f to Tasmania. And he has only gone on to have the biggest impact on Australian spin outside of Shane Warne and Nathan Lyon. And the more I think about what Howard has managed to do, the more it makes me think about all these guys as a group. Because for many years, I used to see them as broken toys from a TV show that was canceled after one episode. A leggy who became an offie, a TV presenter, a postman who retired twice, a union leader, a seamer who became a croupier, two lost South Australian kids, a bunch of miscast batters, KP bait, and the IT worker who got destroyed. But they are all more than this, right? And those players mostly went on to play for Australia. And yeah, it went to hell, but so many of them got a baggy green. And Howard was actually close to a call up when he was young, but it never happened. And of all those guys, he should be the most bitter or broken. And instead, he is still out there, still trying hard, continuing to do his best for Australian spin. It is a weird job being a spinner in a nation of pace. And that is why so many of these stories are so bizarre. Shane Warne has given us so much, memories and wickets. Craig Howard never took a test wicket. 
Yet when Australia won the World Test Championship, it was Nathan Lyon, who he mentored, who took the final wicket. A few tests later, Todd Murphy was in the team as well. There is only one Shane Warne, but the story of Australian spin doesn't begin and end with him. Sure, Australian spin stumbled when he left, but as Lyon has proved, the sun did shine again. If you enjoyed this video, please comment or like it. We have plenty of videos on other great cricket stories like the entire history of New Zealand opening batters or the legend of Vinu Mancad, plus plenty of other content on people like Jasper Boomer and Neil Wagner. Check them all out while you're subscribing and keep coming back for all our new videos.